Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Dr. Amir Khan. Amir is a GP working in inner city Bradford and also a best-selling author. He's currently resident doctor for ITV's Lorraine and Good Morning Britain. Amir's books include his novel, How Not to Have an Arranged Marriage, his children's non-fiction book, How Families Are Made, and in 2020, he released his memoir, The Doctor Will See You Now, The Highs and Lows of My Life as an NHS GP, which became a Sunday Times bestseller. Amir Khan, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my first time on the couch, so I'm looking forward to it. Good, good. I'm going to dive straight in, Amir, and ask if you could tell me about a significant bereavement you've experienced in your life. Yeah, I think the most significant uh, is my dad, who died after a, well, I guess, looking back on it, it probably was expected, but I was so young, I didn't really expect for it to happen i was i was a junior a student doctor sorry at the time and i I was on placement in general practice i remember that we were seeing patients on our own and i had a patient in with me and i got a phone call from one of the reception team and i did that thing which i always do and even to this day i do where i just pick it up and go i'm with a patient like really sharply and then put the phone down and then they did it again, and I did it again, and then they did it again. And before I um, got a word in, she went, no, this is really important. Your sister's on the phone. And and so I was like, okay. And my sister got put through, and she was very distraught, and she told me that my dad had died. And actually what happened was my dad, we've got a really strong family history of heart problems and uh, heart disease. And so he had a number of heart attacks when I was really little, just like when I was about 10 and then again about 14 and 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 he was medically retired. Uh, so he spent a lot of time at home but being unwell because he went into heart failure. And so his heart, and anyone who knows heart failure knows it's got a really poor prognosis, but I didn't, you'd think I'd know it, but it's a bit weird when you're studying medicine, I think. You don't apply what you learn to the people you know. You kind of will apply it really easily to patients and, and get the kind of the diagnosis and the management plan. But when it comes to people, you know, it's a whole different ball game. And so I just kind of thought, oh, he'll be all right. He's been ticking along for a number of years. And then he just wasn't. And it was it was a very odd situation because I was with the patient. I had another student sitting in the room as well. And I was halfway through a consultation. And I, I was just a bit kind of shocked, I think, was probably the right word. Um, and I thought the best thing to do was to try and finish the consultation, uh, which I tried to do, but it was one of those consultations where the patient just kept adding more and more problems <laughs> onto the end. And it got to a point after about 10 minutes, I was like, oh God, well, I said, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to hand this over to the other student there. I'm going to have to go. Um, and yeah, and then I made my way home, which was felt like the longest journey of my life, really. When you said you made your way home, was that to your parents' house? Yes. So I was in Liverpool uh, and they live in Bradford. So I kind of got the bus. It was one of those things where everything takes forever. So I liked the, it felt like the walk from the GP surgery to the bus stop took forever. And then the bus took ages to arrive. And then I had to um, get the train to Leeds and then a- another bus from Leeds to Bradford. So it was a, just a really long journey where every minute felt like I was missing something that was going on because my dad was in the hospital. They were keeping him in A&E in a cubicle until I got there. And it just took so long. And then by the time I did get there, I felt like I missed because the whole family were there. 
I think even to this day, it feels like I missed a, a, an important part where everybody was together when he died. Uh, and, he, you know, they, they, they weren't there at the moment of death because he, he actually, he called an ambulance. He was very short of breath at home. And then the ambulance came and took him, but they were parked outside my mom's house for a long, long time. And he had a cardiac arrest and, and died in the back of the ambulance and they were trying to resuscitate him. So he died at, just outside the house. Um, but then they attempted resuscitation near me as well. And so he'd been there quite a while by the time I got there. So your family were there when you arrived at the hospital and you were able to be with them. You were able to see your dad. Is that right? I was, yeah. So they were all out of the room by this point because I think they they had said what they needed to say and got out what they needed to do with him. So by the time I got there, the nurses had very kindly you know, taken out all the cannulas and tubes and everything and, and made him look presentable. But it was a very surreal experience. And again, you know, now I, years and years down the line, I've been through that with my patients and, you know, I've, I've taken them to the rooms where their relatives have died. But actually, I went in there on my own and it was a, it was just a very surreal experience. It was very sad, and I, I was kind of numb to emotions. I would say because I, do, I I can't remember really feeling overwhelmed. I just felt like it wasn't happening, and yet it was at the same time. And I could hear my mum crying outside, and my sisters as well. And that was kind of distracting me from my own emotions. Yeah, and then it kind of felt that I had to hurry this moment on because they all were waiting for me and my dad was waiting to go to the mortuary and I was the kind of the, the final thing from obstructing that. Uh, and and so I kind of felt like I needed to just be there for a moment, save my goodbyes and then quite quickly move on because everybody was waiting for me to do that so he could go to the mortuary and then we could all go home. That sort of practical head kicking in at the same yes. time, isn't it? It's yes. like, you know, things have got to be done and there's a process to it here and there's other people to think about and consider. And But actually, this is all really surreal and what do you do and what am I supposed to do? Yes, it was just like that. And, you know, and, and bearing in mind, you know, I went to university, a medical school in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so we got a, just a two-week block in palliative care. So, and I was like, oh, well, I know everything there is to know. Well, clearly I was 100% wrong. And I thought I'd know what to do in that situation, but I really didn't. I really didn't. And so all my medical training, I was a final year medical student. So, you know, I've had a very little experience, just, just kind of undergraduate stuff. But all my training just went out the window. When it's yourself and it's your family, no rules that you've learned apply really. That's the thing, you're there, you were there as a son and not a doctor, and you were there as one of the family, not one of the team. Yes. But I, I guess I'm making an assumption here, but I guess in the kind of context of a hospital setting and what's going on, and you spend, your your a medical student, you've been spending time in hospitals then it's not as straightforward then, is it? And I guess you probably fluctuate in between, you know, your head, uh, that kind of, maybe some of that practical stuff and those, that's yeah. the thing about you need to go to the morgue. Maybe that was the doctor bit in your head. That was it. And I was thinking, you know, and it, it's such a weird situation. I was thinking, God, they'll need this room for someone else. We've got to hurry this up. And so that was really my overriding. And the, the nurses did not make me feel that way at all. It was all in my head. And so I spent a few minutes there and then I went to the nurses station and said, yes, it, we can move him to, to the mortuary now. And they were really lovely. You know, there was no pressure whatsoever. But I just knew that there was someone in a who was waiting for that bed. And so, yeah. And when he kind of, when he went to the mortuary, you know, it meant that we could, because my family had been out of the hospital for a number of hours. And so we could go home, which I think was important because in our in our culture, everybody descends on your house when there's been a bereavement, like literally everyone you've ever spoken to or seen. So by the time that we actually got home, word had already got out that he died. And there was just, I can't even describe it, probably about 30 or 40 cars parked outside our house, all of them waiting for us to come home. So when we then arrived home, there was a process of people, probably close to 100, 150 people, just like then immediately at our house, passing on their condolences, making food, making tea, and really more so being there for my mum. Because I think, you know, 
it was really important for her to have all her friends there and their families. And that goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. So I, I took a week off university and then I had to go back since my final year. But every single day from, the, from probably about eight o'clock in the morning, that doorbell would ring and the phone would ring through till two or three o'clock in the morning. The next day, people would be there. People would come from afar and stay over. At the time, it feels like I just need a moment's peace. But in retrospect, the support that brings with it and how much that helped my mom. And also with me, because I'm the only boy out of six sisters. So it was down to me to organize the funeral as well. And I had no idea where to start. So, you know, I just kind of went into the room of uncles. I was like, right, uncles, help me out here. How do I sort out this funeral? And they just, you know, they took me everywhere. They, you know, explained the, everything to me, all the religious side of things as well, which I didn't know anything about. So it was helpful to have that group of kind of the community come together like they do. And I, I, we do that still, you know, now when we hear people die, I remember how important it was to me in retrospect. At the time, like I say, it was kind of like, can I just have a minute? But in retrospect, it was it was really important. And so the, whenever I hear now someone has passed away, whether I know them well or not, I'd always make an effort to go go and see the family because you just remember remember that and you remember who was there as well. You've got a kind of a list of, oh, they were there for us, so we've got to be there for them. Yeah. You mentioned um, culture and religion there. Can you say um, what they are, I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a Muslim and so we have to bury our dead within 24 hours of death. Providing you know there's no post mortem need, and there wasn't, but he had uh, known heart failure, known heart disease, and he had had a uh, an heart attack. So there was you know enough there to put on the death certificate. And so the problem was he died on a Friday, and so getting a death certificate so we could bury him on the Saturday was really difficult because he died in the hospital. So it had to be a hospital doctor who gave the death certificate. And they the tricky thing there is the GP couldn't do it. The GP who knew him couldn't do it. Um, but we were very lucky in that we explained the situation to um, the team at the hospital and they had, because it's Bradford, it's a common occurrence, they had contingency plans and we managed to get a death certificate. And then, you know, you go over to the funeral director, I was driven over there and I didn't really, again, I didn't know what to, to do with it. I just remember them saying now, right, you get a blue form and a pink form and you hand the, this form into the registrar and you hold on to this form and you bring this one back to us. Um, and it was all just kind of right, okay. And the interesting thing is, you know, I remember it really clearly. And now I advise others when when they don't know what to do. And so we have to do some cultural things which involve washing the body before burial. Uh, and so that takes place at the funeral home. And there are his, you know, our closest his closest friends and his family. So I was leading it, but then. You know, my cousin was there. There were other other men there. We wash the body, maintaining dignity at all times. And then we wrap the body in a white cloth and then it can be placed into a coffin. And then what happens is the coffin, this is all in a mosque. And then the coffin goes to a different room where the ladies are and the ladies come and pay their respects. And it's, it's kind of the equivalent of an open coffin. It's got like a window part over the face, but it's got a lid over it, but there's a, a like a glass bit, which you then can close after uh, when it's time for the burial. And so once the women have paid their respect, we collect the coffin, take it in a hearse to the graveyard. And it's only the men who are present at the graveyard. And this is the bizarre thing. And this is the thing that, that I found really difficult. As the son, you have to actively bury your dad. And that, well, that, what I mean by that is you, you know, the coffin is placed in the graves and then you have to place these concrete slabs by hand over the, the coffin. Uh, and that was really hard because you have to, you, you, they, they put these two little ledges on the inside of the grave. So on either side, and you're kind of straddling the coffin, but you're standing on these two little wooden ledges. And then you kind of walk backwards along these ledges and place these huge concrete slabs, which are really heavy, on these ledges. So they sit on top of these ledges, so they're not directly on the coffin. They're just a couple of inches above. And you're doing this alone? Yes. So you have to do this bit alone. You're past the, the slabs, but you're the only person in the uh, grave. And it, it was really wet, and it was really muddy, and it was really slippy. And that sounds really, those are the kind of things you remember, because you're just like, don't fall 
there's hundreds of people here and you know this is our tradition and so you, you're placing these concrete slabs down and then you put the first handful of dirt or mud over those and then everybody takes it in turn to put some soil on top of those concrete slabs and once everybody's had their go at that then the official people come with their machinery and put the the rest of the soil on and maintain the graves and then you go back to the mosque and you know oh, all I remember about that is the practicality side of things. So I had to do that. I had to organize the food. I remember an uncle coming up to me. He just he'd ordered the food from the catering. And I remember him coming up to me and going, haven't you ordered dessert? And that's really stuck in my head for some reason. I was like, it's not that kind of event. You know, there's food here, but there's no dessert. Um, <laughs> and, and he looked really disappointed. <laughs> it was just a bit odd. Um, but yeah, I think all of that meant for me that I didn't have time to process any emotions. And I think that has been a long hangover of that being the only boy having to do all of that stuff meant that I don't think I ever really got the time. And, and having everyone at our house and me having to sit with everyone and talk to them, the amount of times I had to explain his, um, you know, his medical history and how it happened in all of this and what was done. And you're the doctor as well with the information. Yeah. They want details. They want details. And so I don't think I, you know, if, I, if I'm honest about it and I'm not, you know, I'm not upset or angry or anything about it. But if I'm honest about it, I don't remember crying at all. And I don't remember crying since then. I don't think I've had that moment, but that's okay because everybody grieves in different ways. But I don't think I had the space at that point to to really get into how I was feeling. You know, I'm, I was really struck by the image of straddling the coffin on the ledges and being handed these heavy pieces of concrete to place down over your dad's coffin, regardless of how you're feeling emotionally. Some people don't feel like they're able to hold their legs at the side of a graveside at the coffin because they feel so emotionally drained with grief that they sometimes struggle to even feel like they're holding their legs and you've got to straddle on these ledges over the coffin, take the weight of the concrete and place it down and have this roll with all these people watching and it's wet and it's slippy and it's a real kind of just high pressure moment. But actually, it sounds also like I think that responsibility of the son being the only son, the doctor, as you're saying, culturally having so many people around for a long period of time. And yes, that's really supportive as well. But there's that image of straddling and standing on the ledge and having everyone looking at you feels like it ran through all of it. It wasn't just at that moment at the coffin. It's almost a symbol of yeah um the yes. whole experience does that make sense Mary? is that okay for me to it say it that it's just what you can, came you can up. say anything honestly jason it does make sense that i've not really thought of it like that but then if you you know if i look at it through a wider lens you know when you know when i was arranging the funeral i got lots of questions about you know what what time is it where is it can you send out text messages to everyone or you know my sisters were asking me questions about you know what what was to be done and what time and what time they should arrive and then even with the food things, you know, it sounds really, really simple, but it did feel simple. You know, going to the caterers, which is just a house in Bradford, to be fair, uh, and like looking at a menu and picking off, you know, what you want to be there. And I'm thinking, oh God, there's got to be a veggie dish and meat dish and we've got to have rice and naan. And so, you know, all of that. And then reporting back to my mom, who was still in bits and going, you know, mom, I've ordered this, and making sure she was all right with it. So I guess, you know, all of that, and, and, and I sound like I did it all on my own. I definitely did it. You know, I had my school friends were with me uh, and, you know, these uncles who, had, who could drive and had cars were driving me everywhere. And so I did have that support, but the ultimate decisions had to be made by me. I think there's some key messages for listeners in there as well with regards to um, that experience of getting the death certificate and getting all the paperwork done in time because the burial needs to happen within 24 hours. So if anybody's listening who, um, you know, is Muslim themselves and or of any other faith where there's a requirement or a wish or a desire for a, a funeral to happen quickly, then hospital teams and hospice teams are well versed with this and they will do everything they can to make 
make sure that everything's in place. And yes, sometimes it can be tricky if it's five o'clock on a Friday, but actually, you know, it, 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 it's kind of all hands to deck, isn't it often to, to it try is, and make it is. happen? And I would say the same for GP surgeries as well. You know, if we know the patient and we, you know, we looked after them in the last days of, of their lives, we will do the death certificate. And I know how important this is for um, certain cultures. And if I know there's a Muslim patient or a patient who needs a, a funeral arrangement quickly, whether they're Muslim or not, uh, who I'm looking after or who the practice is looking after, uh, then I will often give them my number just for this purpose. I'm not the kind of doctor who gives out my mobile number for anything else, but say, you know, if he dies or she dies over the weekend, I will do the death certificate. And what we try and do as a, as a practice, even if we know one of our patients that we're looking after or the lead clinician for is likely to die over a weekend or a bank holiday, and we're not going to be present, we will put that in an email to the rest of the clinical team and say, can anyone go and see them this week because they're likely to die over there. And it's not just us to do that. The, the district nurses will inform us, the palliative care team will inform us, can someone go out over this week so, so you've seen them? And are you around on the weekend to do the death certificate should the family need it? And we try and do that because where we work in Bradford, we have a, a large Muslim population that really, you know, they don't, you know, they value that above anything. And, and when you do it for them, they are just so thankful. Uh, and it really means a lot. And, you know, yes, it's an hour or so out of your weekend or bank holiday, but it's a, a huge relief to them. You've been talking about your dad. Can I ask what your dad's name is and what kind of man he was? Yes. So his name was Farouk Khan and he came over in the 60s. Uh, he came over on a bus, which always surprises me. He tells me he got the bus from Pakistan to wow. England. And in my head, that doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> <laughs> because I can't, that journey feels very, very long. Um, but he did. Him and, and we've got two uncles. One of them has sadly died now. One of them is still alive. But the three of them came over together on this bus. And they, they talked about, you know, going through Afghanistan and going through the Middle East on this bus and then arriving in Europe and, and going through all these countries and then getting a boat across to the UK. And it just sounds like, um, I mean, it sounds like I couldn't do it, but it sounds like an adventure slash nightmare. <laughs> because I think they slept on this bus, they ate on this bus, they had very little money. You know, we did come from a, a very wealthy family back in, in Pakistan. My dad was originally Indian and then the moon. So, and then he worked in um, kind of toothpaste factories to begin with. Um, and then he worked on the train. So I'm not quite clear what he did on the train, but my mom keeps saying that he worked on the train. But then he was a bus driver. So for as as I can remember, um, he was a bus driver until he was medically retired. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On Sunday, the 3rd of March, let's come together for Marie Curie's fourth annual Day of Reflection. It's a special moment to remember everyone who died during the pandemic. We're encouraging everyone across the UK to take a moment to reflect and to share the name of a loved one they're remembering on the day. So let's acknowledge our grief, take time to reflect and remember and support one another. To find out how you can get involved, visit dayofreflection.org.uk. Can you talk a bit, Amir, about your experience of bereavement after your dad's death um, and or bereavement that you've experienced with other losses and maybe touch on some things that you found helpful? So, like I said, you know, the support of the community was really helpful and you know, not just kind of the emotional support, but the practical support was because I wouldn't even know where to start. And so that was nice. And then, you know, there were all these aunties in our kitchen just constantly making food because new people would arrive and eat cups of tea and, and kind of snacks. And, you know, they would just take care of it and they would clean up after everything as well. So there was that. So I think my experience of bereavement wasn't a good one, if I'm being honest with you, Jason, because yes, I had all that support, but I didn't have the space or the time to kind of feel the bereavement and kind of figure out how I felt and, and how to process that because there were so many things to do. So even after the funeral, so in Islam, we're, we're supposed to grieve for three days. Part of the reason we have such a quick funeral is to try and not become overwhelmed with grief. And we're supposed to kind of not limit, but try and manage our bereavement process within three days and then try and get back to some kind of normality. Obviously, 
that you know the bereavement and the grief is always going to be there uh but that's kind of why that funeral is supposed to be that quickly done and so i guess what came straight after that was just i'll be honest with you Jason, there was just a lot of paperwork Oh, you know, the house was still in my dad's name. We had to transfer that over. There, he didn't have very much money, but, you know, we, we had to sort that out as well because there was no will. And so for me, and probably a couple of my sisters who were doing this as well, it was all a lot of paperwork. And by the time we'd done it all, we're talking like six or eight weeks down the line. And then you can kind of sit back and go, right, you know, what's happened? But then by that time, I had finals at university. And I, I keep, I, I say this a lot. I definitely didn't process my emotions. I didn't have a good bereavement or a grief process, but I've come to terms with that. I'm not, you know, I, it doesn't sit heavy on me or anything like that. I've come to terms with it. It is what it is, but I'll know better for next time because I find myself now, I think more so as I've got older, getting really emotional around kind of dad topics. So like if I see anything on TV that involves a really emotional moment with someone's father, nothing else makes me cry, Jason, but that will. And then, you know, and if someone's father does die, that really, really upsets me. And nothing else hits me in the same way. So I think there's something bubbling underneath. But I think since then, what, what I've learned from that experience is how important for my patients and for the people I know, um, grief and bereavement is and how individual it is. And I talk very openly with my patients, you know, when they're struggling with grief and bereavement, and I will give them, you know, my experience with my dad and say, look, I didn't have a good experience, I don't think. But, you know, these are the ways to avoid that really, you know, lean into your emotions. There's no end point to when you should be feeling not sad anymore. Uh, and it will come in waves and all of the things that you you know we we know happens with grief and bereavement and so i think having that very honest conversation with them i hope helps them in a way because a lot of them will come and see me when they feel like their grief reaction has gone on too long in inverted commas and that they feel that they should be seen better but you and i know that, that there is no limit to that and it will be different for everyone and there's no right and wrong way and so that's when I kind of open up those conversations. And when they try and shut down their emotions is when things go kind of awry, I think. And so, yeah, so it, it's kind of a forward in that respect. Also, it was a sudden death and it was shocking and it was unexpected. And I think that makes a difference as well, doesn't it? You know, in, yeah. in how we grieve. And I think not that it makes it any easier at all, knowing when somebody is, say, living with a terminal illness and they're dying and we know that it's coming. But, you know, I think that makes the grief different. And Yeah. And um, I was also thinking when you were talking about, um, and I think this is for anybody listening as well, no matter how many years later it is, you know, as revisiting um, uh, some sort of rituals around um, death and loss. And, you know, I mean, that, that could be anything, it could be lighting a candle, it could be uh, going to the park with a balloon filled or helium and letting it go and watching it go up into the sky or you know whatever feels right for you but actually taking some specific time out and whether that's around the anniversary of the death or a particular day or time of year that is meaningful just for you in general to go and carry out a ritual of some sort um i think those things are really helpful yeah yeah i tell you what's helped me in that respect Jay said actually now that you've kind of said i've never really thought of it as a ritual but now you've said that it, it kind of makes sense so it's very commonplace for us to go and visit our dead at their graves you know two or three times a week it's just part of what we do when we go and we pray there and the prayers are there to kind of give to them so they take those prayers forward in, in heaven but what's happened at the <laughs> if you ever get a chance to go you should go the cemetery in Bradford, it's, on a, it's aptly named Cemetery Road in Bradford. And uh, it's now turned into a bit of a competition about which grave site is the nicest and most tented to. And so everybody plants these. <laughs> the other thing that we believe, which I think is a really nice belief, is that if you plant plants or trees or something, you know, we're not allowed to plant trees because they're too big, but beautiful plants and flowers on the graves because they're getting the nutrients from the dead person, essentially. They also 
um, send those rewards back to heaven, which is quite, I think is quite a nice uh, belief, really. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely. And so everybody, and I'm a, I'm a keen gardener, Jason, so I take this very seriously. Uh, and so we get like the most beautiful plants and like really just make the graves look gorgeous. And if you go to a Muslim graveyard, it is adorned with gorgeous plants, flowers, you know, everybody kind of gets them, you know, those, those mum and dad kind of flower sets and like they get replenished twice a week so they never die. And so it's actually a really positive feeling place. And there's lots of families there. It's not, you know, quiet at any point in the day, really. You can go at any point and there'll be lots of children kind of playing around there. And because, you know, we want to teach them that this is what you do when, you know, when we die, we want you to come to our graves. And it's not a sad place to be. It's actually quite, quite nice. Lots of those helium balloons. And yeah, it's a really colourful, colourful place to be. Uh, and if you go on Eid or during Ramadan, you can't even get a parking space, Jason. It is impossible. So it is like rammed with, with huge crowds of people. And I think that's really nice. And so, you know, I grew up in Bradford. So I, you know, a lot of not a lot, but a, well, yeah, probably a lot of my aunties and uncles have, have since died. And I know that they're buried there. So I can go and visit their graves and say something for them as well as my dad. And my mu- you know, I take my mum over and she knows half the graveyard. So I have to like block out three hours for that visit. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's a really positive place to be. But from a horticultural point of view, honestly, it's better than Kew Gardens. You, you should just go and have a look. It's yeah, fantastic. it sounds fantastic. And also what I really love is you were saying it's not quiet, obviously, because it's busy often and there's people there, but also it means death isn't quiet. It's not hushed-hushed. Yep. It's not no. secret and it's not hidden away and it's not taboo. Well, I mean, it's not something, you know, you know, it's it's something that's obviously open and yep. life and death is acknowledged and celebrated and colorful and alive yeah yeah it definitely feels alive that's a good word and you know like i say it's lovely to hear children playing while their parents are praying and it's nice just to see all the different generations and this like you know little old ladies sat in chairs at the end of a, of a grave and you go and talk to them and they've got like picnics as well people bring food uh, and they're quite happy to share that food and it, it's just a really nice place to be one of the other aims of this podcast, as well as sharing stories about death and dying and bereavement, we know that people who listen to the podcast might be caring for someone with a terminal illness themselves and or grieving or just interested as well. And one of the things we often talk about and touch on, certainly in our work, is planning ahead and planning for the future. And that might be, you know, something very practical, like writing a will, or it might be writing down wishes for our care and treatment, should we get a terminal illness or should we become unwell. So can I ask, do you ever think about your own death? Well, I have since I bought a house because you have to get life insurance, don't you? And that really focuses your mind on it. But, um, you know, I am the, the palliative care lead GP for our practice. And so what that means is I, I go to a lot of meetings to discuss the, the, the patients to end of life. I'll go and see a lot of them as well and make sure that things are ticking along well in that department. And that means having conversations. You'll know about respect forms, but having conversations with families and their loved ones about having a good death and what that means for them, how they want that to look from a financial point of view, the will, all of that stuff, but where they want to die, who they want to be uh, with, how much intervention they want, all of those kind of really practical but conversations that are difficult to start, but once you get going are really important and timing them right. So that, again, has made me look at you know what I want in my kind of, well, after I die, during I, you know that, that whole process, I definitely want my family around me. You know, I, w- I would love to be at home, but I know that's not depending on the situation. You know, and be comfortable. And I don't want it to be like a really somber uh, event. I would, I would quite like in my head. I'm kind of caught. <laughs> I'm sorry, and it completely goes against my culture. So my mum will never allow it. But in my head, I would quite like a '90s vibe funeral. <laughs> where we kind of play some 90s music uh, afterwards, like <laughs> my favourite songs. I want people to be sad, and you know, because I do want to be missed. I don't want them to be having too good a time, but I don't want them to be like too depressed. So it would be quite nice to go, oh, yeah, 
this song reminds me of a beer or you know this kind of dance move reminds me of a beer something like that i think uh <laughs> rather than i love oh, that is sad he's gone <laughs> but i know it won't be like that because we've got cultural things we've got to stick to so i'm hoping there'll be like an after party just for like by invite only <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan. well you can you can actually put simple funeral wishes in your will and so you could add that in as well as I should as well as the guest the list of, yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> that's something to think about but yeah it just focuses your mind doesn't it you will know working where you work as well it focuses your mind on I, I made my mum to a will and I you know I made my mum really tell us everything about what she wants when she when she died she hated talking about it because there's some kind of superstition within our culture that goes, if you talk about it, you're encouraging it in, which is nonsense. So in our culture, it's weird. You know, the, the actual death and, and the dying process is not taboo. And the funeral isn't taboo. And all of that stuff I talked about with the, the graveyard afterwards, all of that is so welcoming to children and people of all generations. But the bit that people struggle with is otherwise healthy people planning their death. Because there's a lot of kind of this idea that you, you know, you're tempting saint. Uh, and we've got lots of different words for it in our culture. And so people are reluctant to talk about it because, you know, if it does happen, it's because you talked about it and you weren't careful and, and all of this. So so we've got to overcome that. Uh, and I think that's a quite a, a steep mountain to climb and overcome. I think so many people fear that, though, that kind of... That sits underneath. I mean, you know, having worked in myself, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this yourself, but having worked in hospice care specifically um, for many years, you know, I, I would, I, certainly in my early days, you know, as a social worker, kind of working on the inpatient unit and have the assumption that by the time families came in or individuals came in, um, you know, they would have had lots of those conversations and no you know, often never had conversations about death and dying um, and coming into an inpatient unit in a hospice, really sick. And of course, not everybody who comes into a hospice comes into a hospice to die. Hospices do many, many different things. People go into hospices just to get symptoms under control if they're struggling at home and then they go back home. Yeah, I would say about hospices, a bit like the graveyard that I described where everybody was there and it was a very positive experience. People have this image of what a hospice will be like when you go and be really somber. And the opposite is true. It's actually one of the most life-affirming places there is ever. And I feel that when I go and see my dad at, at the grave, you know, there's, there's the auntie with her paratas and her curries insisting that I eat. And, you know, all these kids running around and, you know, all, all these people just walking around and praying at different graves. It's really life affirming. And when I go to a hospice to see patients or or friends and family, it's the same thing. You know, it, you know you've, you've got the somber moments when you need the somber moments. But by and large, you know, it's a really positive place to be. And food another podcast in itself but i think it's the, the the sort of the therapeutic element of food is it gives us something to do you know it gives the focus doesn't it it keeps you busy and it's about giving and loving really yeah yeah and food plays a big part in our culture if the food isn't good you're in trouble which is why i was like on tender hooks <laughs> that's your all i was really nervous when the man asked me about dessert i wish i'd order some rust for life <laughs> yeah, but but isn't it funny as well because that stuck with you forever. Yeah. And every time I see him anywhere, I think you are the man who asked me about dessert at my dad's funeral. But obviously, that's in my head. Outside, I'm like, "Hello, Uncle, how are you?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I can see a helium balloon with a picture of that dessert on being flown up into the sky, <laughs> and you can it wave goodbye to yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I should. I need to let it go. You're right. <laughs> Quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, just before we finish, can I ask if there's anybody listening who is bereaved? And grieving now is there anything you could say to them yes i would say to you that everybody's grief is different and grief is i always describe it as, when I, as the painful side of love isn't it you love someone and then they die and then grief is the opposite side of that same coin it's love turned over into pain and um just as you would never stop loving that person, the pain is, you know, everyone will say time heals the wounds and all, all of this kind of stuff, but it, 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 that's not necessarily true. The pain, just as your love is going to be there forever, the pain will be there, but it will become easier to live alongside and you learn to grow around 
around it. And it might not feel that way right now. And, and all that you can feel is pain, but the love will come back into that relationship you had with them and it will overtake the the pain and the grief emotions that you've got. Uh, and everybody's time frame on that is different. So if someone's done it, you know, in a few weeks or a few months, that doesn't mean it'll happen for you. And each time you lose someone, that process is different for you as well. But it will happen and that pain will turn back to love. I think that's so lovely and so true. And it's kind of seven and eight years since my parents died. And it's so interesting how it changes over the years and um, how that love overtakes or the memories of overtakes the kind of tougher times you know yeah the, the sort of tougher bits um how's it been today being on the Marie Curie couch it's been really therapeutic I don't think I've talked in that depth before about my father's death and the the process that was involved uh so it's been a pleasure thank you for listening to it good good well amir khan thank you for joining me on the marie curie couch thank you for sharing some of farouk khan's story and it's been lovely to meet you and you thank you so much so that's all for this episode of on the marie curie couch we hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Content. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye.